currently for a charity part-time called Maslaha, which focuses on issues of social inequality facing British Muslim communities. Uh, Maslaha works across health, gender, uh, criminal justice, and tries to take a both grassroots and policy, tries to have a grassroots and policy impact through its work by working with communities. Uh, and and most, most projects tend to have a creative bent to, the, to, to sort of how they manifest. Uh, so like it's very apt for this conversation as well, but I don't think I have time to cover, cover that in the presentation. But anyway, I thought I'd begin just by referencing very briefly a few organizations and individuals who have inspired my own approach to uh, creativity, social change, and also thinking about home and creativity in particular. Um, they include the poet Remy Kanazi, who's written extensively as a US-based poet about his experiences of, uh, or his grandmother's and mother's experience of being, uh, not, not having the right of return to, to uh, occupied Palestine. Uh, and often that poetry is, you know, deeply infused with sort of longings of home. Uh, and I interacted with him when I was 16. So I was lucky enough to sort of come across him through being part of a, a youth poetry collective at the local youth center I was, I was going to. Um, and the person who ran that youth poetry collective was someone called Argy, who's at the bottom of the screen. So I thought it was just important to pay homage to people who, you know, I think citation is important, especially in the point of where a lot of people accrue social capital by not citing people and I think these people, both of them have inspired me. And uh, Voices That Shake, if anyone's heard of them, arts education program based in the Brady Art Center. They, don't, they haven't run for a couple of years, but essentially a lot of it is about getting young people from uh, working class backgrounds, from, from non-white backgrounds, uh, uh, anyone who is sort of on the margins and systemically discriminated against in, in our society uh, and to, to essentially apply you know, a lot of the things they might be finding difficult in their lives in intangible, in intangible ways and using the arts to sort of confront a lot of those systemic oppressions. So yeah, basically that's just a quick, brief little view of who's inspired me and like shaped my thinking. And I'll start with something that's less specifically about housing, but probably more uh, conceptually about the idea of and, and, and the, the thing like, the idea of home and what home means to us uh, in terms of places of familiarity, of, of community assets, so to speak, which could be defined as, as you know, as places that uh, signify home. And it, the project that I was involved in in 2015, 2016 uh, was to co-create and co-produce this uh, zine, uh, a magazine. Um, and it, the context is this is about Shepherd's Bush Market, which I, I I'm deeply familiar with the area and also uh, knew someone and had an uncle who worked in the market at the time. And just a very brief context, um, the market was, the land was owned by Transport for London and through a compulsory purchase order, uh, green lit by uh, the, cult the community secretary, Eric Pickles, or Eric Pickle, I can't remember which one it is. Pickles, I think it's Pickles. He... <laughs> he greenlit a CPO com compulsory purchase order and a property developer then bought for about 50 million uh, the land of the market. And it was gonna be redeveloped with no promises to the existing traders that they would remain because they, were gonna re they, weren't, promise they, were they weren't guaranteeing that they weren't gonna increase the rents. They were also planning to build luxury housing on top of the market, which is obviously a huge point. So I think that at that point, we, we me and a couple of others put this scene together and it's, Again, I guess in, in many ways using um, using our, our skill set, you know, of, of combined of sort of interviewing and researching people, uh, building connections and relationships with people. Obviously, I had an in knowing someone in the market, but recognizing that some people had been been in the, in that particular market since uh, World War One. Um, so you know, three generations, and we felt it was important alongside. The tenants association existing campaign to fight for that space uh to to remain and and to be to be clear as well the traders did want the market to improve but they didn't want to be booted out the market and they didn't want resident luxury residential property to be built on it so um 
yeah, ultimately the market traders were successful in their campaign, but we ran this just before that in 2015. We did an event to launch the zine uh, at Bush Hall with Andy Slaughter, the MP, and Big Zoo, the Grime MC, quite a diverse um, group of people performing and market traders as well. So that, that I guess, gives some indication of, of where I sort of, you know, began to, obviously was thinking critically about home before that, but I think an actionable thing I was involved in as a cultural producer, I think sometimes that term is a bit ambiguous, but hopefully that gives an example of the kind of work I was um, involved in in 2015. Something I'm gonna move on to, which is relevant to the clip that I will share uh, or that John will share is a campaign to save a community space in South Kilburn. And again, a lot of these examples aren't directly about housing specifically, but they're in a context where it's about community assets that exist in, in particular communities that are you know, undervalued and uh, essentially aren't seen as commercially viable or profitable and therefore seen as not very useful. Um, and we, the, the Granville, so the Granville was a former Presbyterian church. Oh, it was built by the Presbyterian church. It wasn't a former Presbyterian church. It was built by the Presbyterian church in, nine, in, 18, in, the, in 1885, 1884, in South Kilburn. Um, and if anyone who is familiar with that area will know it's, it's very diverse, but incrementally, you know, Irish migrants uh, came to Kilburn, uh, South Kilburn, uh, Afro-Caribbean communities, Somali communities more recently. It's a very uh, diverse community. And um, the, the Granville was a community center, but it was initially baths, like public baths, which spoke to the sort of the, the issues of the time, which was, no one had uh, access to sort of bathing themselves at that time. So there were, there were public baths to access. Um, and then it became, a, you know, through various iterations, wedding hall, people do sort of um, funeral rites and services there, uh, community events, all sorts of different stuff would happen. So we decided basically in 2016 as well, a lot was happening in 2016. A lot of this stuff is just continuous, just a continuous thing, isn't it? But I think at that time, Brent Council decided to demolish completely the Granville and build um, luxury housing. It's almost like a bingo thing, isn't it? You can just chuck that word, it's just... But the, I think, I also think there are more sophisticated methods of, of, of people, you know, uh, councils and, and local authorities and, and different people in power trying more sophisticated methods which hopefully we'll get onto in in the further conversation um in regards to art washing but in this instance uh we decided to, to to launch a campaign and it was run by primarily uh leslie barson and d woods who ran the community kitchen so every friday they do a hot meal and um because they were trying to demolish brent council were trying to demolish the center we, we found out that Zadie Smith's mom used to work there and Zadie Smith used to use it. So we invited her to come through and do a reading, which she kindly accepted the invitation. She came from New York to come in and do this. And yeah, I think obviously this is more of a live event situation. We, we not only invited her, we invited Caleb Femi, the Young People's Law Poet Laureate. We invited Zia Ahmed, who is former Channel 4 playwright in residence and is from Cripplewoods and nearby and Jay Unity, who won Britain's Got Talent. So it was like quite a diverse group of, of uh, artists involved and all contributing to obviously save this very vital community asset, which was fr uh, providing free community meals on Fridays and whose youth services had been gutted and et cetera. I think we all, all sort of are familiar with the usual story. So yeah, the event was a success. This is us with, with, with Zadie and, and Leslie Barson, D. Woods, and Delia Snoozy, the filmmaker behind the clip that we'll, I'll, I'll share. So yeah, I think that ultimately was successful in Brent Council being shamed into reversing their decision. Uh, so I was involved in programming the event specifically. Um, and yeah, they reversed their decision. The, the center remained, it's, it's facing difficulty right now in a different way. But I guess it's another example of perhaps my involvement just checking the time cool my involvement in a campaign which looks at home and um creativity and using uh you know using my skills as a producer to to try and contribute to something uh 
so briefly i think i don't think i have a huge amount of time left i'm not actually sure do i i don't know um but basically yeah you've got like four four or five more minutes okay cool thank you jasmine um so basically this um this brings me on to uh my work as a, a producer for a venue called uh, free word center um where Hannah, Hannah, who you'll hear from next, has performed as well uh, many times. And it's an art center based in Farringdon. And uh, prior to my work with Masala, I worked there for two years and we would program multi art, uh, we would program seasons of multi art sort of uh, events and commissions. And each one would be uh, themed. So we, we decided to do a themed uh season or festival on home and it was called writing our way home and it, and it had about 18 events i think the intention of it again similarly was to highlight in many ways what this what this meeting is trying to do which is how precarious people's lives are in terms of ge in a geographic sense in an identity sense home is, is deeply contested we're in a very in dire straits as a world and it, you know climate catastrophe is is impending Wow, it's a really cheery note, isn't it, I guess? But basically all those, all those very like serious concerns we wanted to try and address through this season. And I'm highlighting this particular event, which was my favorite personally out of all of them. And it was featured, uh, it was curated by Ed Daffin, who co-authored the Grenfell Action blog, and he's part of Grenfell United, and uh, Loki, the rapper and activist. Essentially, they wanted to curate an evening where they brought together activists to uh, speak to tactics of, of defense around uh, public space, community assets and housing. Uh, and we produced a little mini zine by the end of it, uh, bringing together all those voices uh, and like just just analyzing from, you know, Green for Grenfell to uh, the South Kilburn campaign to other campaigners outside of London. Um, what successful, what worked, what didn't culturally, you know, materially, what are the different advantages and disadvantages of each of those things so yeah i think that's my time because then i've got we sharing this clip aren't we so cool um yeah so just i guess now john will share a clip from a unreleased documentary uh called uh, granville for us by us which is a film which is made by delius news was pictured in the previous slides and it looks at the campaign, the, the current campaign, and features Tokyo Myers, who's in, who was, who won Britain's Got Talent, I think, in 2017 as a pianist, but he's brilliant and he, he actually used the Grand Vaux as well. But yeah, thank you. You know, I performed for the first time actually upstairs when the hall was the hall, and now it's all changed and it looks like an office space, which is just weird. Um, that room in particular was such a vibey room. And, um, you know, again, that's gone. So yeah, just, just uncomfortable. Yeah, straight up uncomfortable. It's all gonna go flat. Well, it's all boarded up now. The pub's gone, all the shops are gone. The flats all got boarded up and all that. The community as I know, as a young kid, where somebody comes and hello, can I buy a bottle? Can I buy some sugar? Can I buy some, you know, some milk? That's all gone now. It might go on, but I don't know anybody that I could buy any milk from, or or anybody that asked me for milk. That's all gone now. The studio's gone. The car park where we used to chill out is gone. Where we used to fry our barbecue, gone. Gone. Now you've got little young ones that are growing up. They're in a ghost town. That's what South Cuban is now. Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank, you so, thank you so much, Zane. I'm going to hand over to Hannah now. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, it's good to be here and really fascinating to hear um, Zane about your work that you've been doing. Um, so I'm going to talk and read some poems at the same time. I'm going to interweave both. And uh, one of the things Zane said about 
you know, the way in which home is so contested now um, really strikes a chord with me. And that's kind of slightly what, I've, yeah, I guess I've based my little bit of talk and reading around that idea. And I was thinking to myself that for me, you know, everywhere I've lived um, in and around London has changed, has gentrified. Ilford, where I grew up, Brixton, where I lived for most of my um, adult life until I became a mum and I moved to Wood Green, which is now slowly gentrifying. You know, the winds of change are blowing. Um, but even the house that I grew up in was a contested space because uh, I, I lived with my nan, who had moved from the East End to escape the immigrants, in her own words, and my parents, who were a mixed race couple. My mum was white and English, daughter of my nan, and then my dad, who um, was Afro-Caribbean Chinese, who had come from Jamaica. So my nan's discomfort with the immigrants was played out in quite interesting ways when her uh, black son-in-law <laughs> was living upstairs from her uh, and present in our house was all the kind of iconography of those three different cultures. Um, so I think for me in many ways I was aware of home as a contested or divided space from a very early age um, and I was thinking recently about a memory I had of when I realized that it wasn't just my own house that was contest a contested space, but actually the area in which I grew up, you know, the BMP, were very active in Ilford and Barking and Dagenham in the 1980s. And uh, I thought I would begin by sharing with you a poem that's about that historical moment, but thinking about how that historical moment um, reflects onto the, the contemporary. I should say that the reason my nan ended up living with my mum and dad it was all to do with money. They couldn't afford um, to buy a house separately. So there's always that idea of, you know, how do you get a roof over your head? Um, and then lots of the arguments that were framed, you know, the BNP would use at the time were framed around our ideas about immigrants. They come over here and they take what's ours. They take our um, jobs, they take our houses, our homes. Um, so I'm going to begin by reading a poem about that moment, that BMP leaflet. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let me see if this works. Um, hang on, I think. Hopefully everyone can see that. Let me just... Um, sorry. All my little windows are in the way. Bear with me. Uh, so yeah, so the image hopefully you can see there is of that, is of A, B and P leaflet, it's our country, let's win it back. But I've conflated um, this poem with an event that I'm sure that many people that are old enough will remember, which is um, of, uh, sorry, sorry, bear with me, which is of, um, oh, I'm having some tech problems, hang on. Uh, can everyone still see my screen? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, is of the great storms of 1987, um, when, uh, you know, the south of England was hit by, um, you know, gale force winds, famously Michael Fish, you know, like I said, there was nothing, nothing was going on. But, uh, so the poem is a kind of about 1987, but also the idea of home is being contested and my dad features in, in the poem, 1987. The front yard fence down and my father smoking at the window, watching the road. The radio's all-day drama, gales 100 miles per hour, two fishermen killed at Dover Harbour. Our country never had big weather, not like those far-off hurricanes they tried to gentle with names like Iris, Gilbert, Lenny. Last week, a slip of paper blew in through our letterbox, Dad standing at the coat rack, squinting behind his glasses at bold red letters, BMP, a Union Jack. All day, those gales blew hard, tore chimneys off of roofs, slammed elms and chestnuts down like bodies on car bonnets. Thousands are stranded without power. My father looking worried as though the wind that blew him from Jamaica 40 years ago might rise again and blow him back. 
So, um, which I go back to my PowerPoint. So hopefully, um, I think people may be able to see some of the resonances between um, uh, the rhetoric sort of expressed in by the BNP in that poem, the idea of they come over here, they take our jobs, take our houses, and uh, the kind of contemporary, uh, you know, um, rhetoric and anti-immigration rhetoric, and especially the stuff that's been happening around deportation. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm having such trouble with Zoom. I don't know how to go back to my slides and move on to the next slide. So I might actually just stop the share for now. There we go, and have me instead. So the next poem I thought I would read to you is um, about the gentrification of Brixton. I lived in Brixton until 2012, when I think that was, for me, the year that I really began to see some of the changes there becoming entrenched. Um, but Brixton, uh, you know, when I first lived there, I remember people always saying, like, you know, how safe is it to live in Brixton? You know, is it, you know, don't, don't you ever get trouble in Brixton? I never had any trouble in the 15 years that I lived there. But Brixton is a kind of really important, I suppose, like a nodal point in my own thinking about identity because of its kind of Caribbean heritage. But my dad, in fact, never liked Brixton because when he went there in the 1970s, it very much reminded him of the poverty um, in Jamaica. So the poem that I'm gonna read to you now is written in three parts and it's about Brixton changing. So the first part is about uh, Brixton in the 1970s and is narrated through the voice of my father's cousin telling me about my dad's attitudes to, to Brixton in the 70s. And the second part is about remembering Brixton through the filter of the film Babylon, which some of you may know, um, but Brixton in the 1980s, when it was really a very, very much a contested place where the sus laws were often implemented against um, young black people, particularly young black men. Um, and then moving to the kind of more current moment, you'll hear the date in the poem, what's happening in Brixton more recently. And the poem's called New Flower with Old. One. Lorna writes from Canada, the year was 1970. Your daddy drove me down to Brixton and we parked up on a side street strung with winter mist. What, she said, watch this. A woman in a house dress and wooden slippers hung at a shop door calling for half a pound of salt fish and a big gill of oil. She was a ghost from my past, backwater Jamaica. Men sat on the low wall and everyone so poor, just making out, just enough. What's changed from home, your dad said. The shopkeeper bedding rocks of salt and mackerel to weigh it down, puffing new flour with old, a man just like my father, your daddy said. Two. I lie in my room on the hill watching Babylon again. Brixton, 1980, flickers blue on the screen. I always want the idle lions to win, who doesn't? I like the Indian mogul with his sing-song accent selling exclusive vinyl on Cold Harbor Lane. Brixton is a bombed out maze where police hunt early hours black boys. What's changed is that today is March the 10th, 2012, and the sun comes out for the first time in months. Three. Gentrification doesn't shift the corner profits, but doubles them. A new man in neon yellow cross gestures wildly on a crate and outside boots, a Bible sound clash makes us laugh. So great is the stake in our salvation. I buy a handmade cupcake in a papier mache box and fair trade flat white from the Coffee Federation. But someone stunned still got chased last week from Blacker Dread to Loughborough Junction and died by a wall on Moreland's estate. Five bicycles racing away as we ate honest burgers, licked our fingers in the market, sweet dim sum. Siobhan says, I'm part of it, but I say, this is just a place I live. The American bookseller and I wax on about change being a good thing. Rosa, his dog, has a new green blanket beside plays and poetry. She's still queen of the sofa, knows what she likes and where she belongs. Okay. 
Um, okay, I am going to have to work out how to share my screen again because I want to show you the next poem if I can. Uh, bear with me. So, um, yeah. Um, hopefully, you can. so uh, that's my slide that you saw at the MP. That was World Brixton in the 1980s. Um, yeah, so uh, when I moved to Wood Green, um, also in 2012, um, this was shortly before uh, some of the kind of social protests that went on about the way in which Harringay Council was trying to kind of remodel Wood Green. Um, and there was a plan to kind of demolish a road just behind the High Street, Caxton Road, and Mays Road. And the photograph here shows people kind of protesting. And the idea again about home being a contested space. And I saw that most enacted in Wood Green, in the block of flats where I live, which is a, I live on a shared ownership block and wherever there's shared ownership, they're meant to build um, social housing next door. So we've got these two blocks of flat and a big communal garden behind. And um, my block of flats is architecturally different to the social housing block of flats. We've got an indoor lift and a foyer for a start, whereas the, out, the other block has got so it's kind of typical, I guess, like council um, outdoor lift, outdoor walkways, and you the flats are not of the same spec. They're not of the same standard. The standard isn't as high. And we have this big communal garden, and a woman that I know that lives in on the council side um, received a letter in the post about three years ago saying that the council children weren't allowed anymore to use the communal garden. Um, but the children on the shared ownership side could. And both these blocks of flats look over the garden. There's loads of children in both flats. And up until that point, all the children had been playing in the garden together. So it got me thinking what an interesting metaphor. I mean, I was appalled, but also the poet in me. So an interesting metaphor this is for the way in which home and space is, is so contested. So in the next poem that I'm going to show you, it's a kind of form that I decided to invent called the borderliner that tries to kind of like meld together two narratives. So on one half of the poem, I'll tell the story about the, the block of flats. Um, and on the other half, I tried to tell a bigger story about kind of global issues of like uh, equality and disparity. So this is the poem here and it's called The Garden Is Not For Everyone. So I wrote these poems so that you could both um, read down in separate columns, the non-bold and the bold text, but also actually read across. There's meant to be like a kind of third sense or a third space, I guess, um, a third way of seeing connections between these two things. Um, but I'll, I'll read the two sides separately. So I'll read the left-hand side first, then the right-hand side, but I won't read them both together, but obviously you can feel free to look across at the lines. The garden is not for everyone. All summer, the children had been running in the communal garden, kicking a football through the yellow roses, chasing across the parched ground. I hear their cries from the fourth floor on my side of the block. And some days I take my boy down there to play with Luna's boys, Alba, Adam, Ali. They live on the council side. Luna is Ethiopian, I think, and I mean to ask her when I see her down on our street, baby bound and batik on her chest, but instead, we talk about the letter in her mailbox. The council children can no longer use a communal garden. There is no reason. In the global refugee crisis, Amar is searching for his brother on a train. The bodies roll out on the platform. A woman lifts a card sign, help us, save our souls. A child who looks like my child is asleep in the calm waters of a tourist beach. The newspapers don't know how this story ends, but describe the smell of 71 people dead in a truck on the highway. We sincerely wish we could help in the global refugee crisis. So, um, I'm not sure how much time I've got left. Jasmine, can you tell me? It's just probably like two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So I'm just gonna read one final poem. So I'm thinking about how poetry can be as well as like a vehicle for exploring all kinds of like awful, like bad realities as this one does. It can also be a vehicle for exploring a kind of more hopeful reality. So um, 
my last slide, which I'm not going to be able to move across to, <laughs> okay, is of my son, Rory, on his scooter, and he's now six, so he's much smaller there. And I'll finish by reading this poem, Scooting, which is about imagining a future where maybe there is less danger to children, but I'm particularly thinking here about cars and traffic and pollution. Um, the poem's called Scooting, and on the, this, this is the last thing I'll read, Scooting. Now Rory wants to scoot on his own, damn it. To soar one-footed down the high street. Who cares about red lights or buses or the reckless cars? You cars should watch it, else he'll mount your bonnet and flick his wheels until his scooter whirled like a helicopter blade on your old tin roof. Might even lift you, levitate a troop of cars into the sky while the boys and girls below look up to wave and call out toodaloo or kneel to aim their finger guns. And when the cars can bust, a million curlicues of car dust will decorate the sky and spin around my boy, scooting on his own between the stars and planets across the moon. Okay, I'm gonna finish there. Um, thank you for your time. And sorry for my technical glitches. I was trying to like read poems on screen, share screen and talk all at once. It didn't quite seem to be working, but. Thank you so much, Anna. That was really lovely. I always love hearing your poetry and, and the commentary around it. And so we're going to leave YouTube live now. So thank you to everyone on YouTube for watching. And if you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Um, and we